Take your Bibles, if you would, please, and let's go back to the passage that we've been, you know, really working over, and that is Romans chapter 10. Romans chapter 10, and we're looking at a very unusual passage of Scripture to look at, at least uh, by traditional standards. Uh, At Christmas, we don't think of this passage, but the truth is, it talks about the coming of the Lord, and boy, there is no more appropriate thought than the fact that Jesus came. So we're sort of on a mining expedition, looking at Romans 10, verses 9 to 13. The fact is, is that at Christmas, we uh, celebrate that a that Jesus came to a humble couple that was, he was born in humble circumstances. He was heralded by angels to the humble shepherds, and he did all of what he did in the humility of humanity. I said it this way, infinity confined himself to humanity and was born as a baby. A baby was born to a virgin woman. A heavenly child was sent to a needy world as a savior, Lord, and risen king. Now, I'm only going to take you now and lead you into one more point of discovery as we talk about the essential Christmas Christmas truth. And we're just going to look at one more. Over the last couple of weeks, we've looked at only one thought each week. And the first one, the first week was, who came to earth? And the answer was, the Lord God came to earth in human form. The second question that we asked was, what did he do when he came? The answer from the passage of Scripture that we're studying is, is that he came, was born, and then he died, and he rose from the dead. In fact, the only two things that are stated in the verses are that he is Lord and that he rose from the dead. Of course, in order to rise from the dead, he had to first be human, then he could die, then he would be buried, and then he rose from the dead. All of those things are included. Now, as I closed last time... I said that Jesus came to a cradle and he headed toward the cross on his way to the crown. And that is exactly the truth about our Lord Jesus Christ. This is essential for saving faith. Now, let's stand and we're going to read the passage. Last week, the first two weeks, we read verse 9 and 10 only. This week, we're going to read the entire passage from verse 9 through 13. The whole thought is contained And uh, we're going to look at it together. Now, if you're our guest today, this is not unusual. This is usual. We stand in honor of the Word of God, God, just like Ezra did in the Old Testament. And we read it together out loud because we want to not only read it on the page, but we want to hear it in our ears. And so we're going to do it. So if we could have the, the verses up there now, we are going to begin and read 9 through 13. Read aloud with me beginning now. That if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For with the heart one believes unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. For the scripture says, whoever believes on him will not be put to shame. For there is no distinction between Jew and Greek. For the same Lord is over all, is rich to all who call upon him. For whoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. Today I'm taking as my text and as the main thought for everything I say, the phrase that says, the same Lord over all is rich to all who call on him. He is rich. Father, I pray that you would help us this morning as we examine once again this passage of scripture and I pray as I go through these essential Christmas truths I pray father that it would that it would just take root in our heart and I pray that we would understand and I pray that if there's one here today that has never called on you Jesus to be savior I pray today would be the day we ask this in Jesus name amen you can be seated unfortunately there are many today that do not believe that the Old Testament is pertinent or valuable for the life in which we are living today. They think, well, we're New Testament Christians, and so let's just uh, just, uh, stop talking about this this God of judgment and thunder of the Old Testament. Let's move on to the New Testament, and let's just talk about Jesus who's just loving, forgiving, and kind. Now, I'm not even going to take that thought to task this morning except to say this. John 5.22 says that the Father has committed all judgment to the Son. 
In other words, Jesus, the one that we think is loving, forgiving, and kind, which he is, he didn't come to earth the first time to judge, he came to save, but the second time, the second time he's coming in great power and glory, and he's going to judge the earth. The truth is this morning that every time an Old Testament or a New Testament prophet, apostle, or teacher, or preacher, any one of them, when they cited, quote unquote, the scriptures, the words are used there, the scriptures, every time they did that, they were talking about the Old Testament. When Peter stood up on Pentecost and preached and quoted, he was quoting the Old Testament. Every time Paul said something or another according to the Scriptures, he was talking about the Old Testament because the rest of it wasn't written yet. Now, let me read an example. Paul, as was his custom, went to them, and for three Sabbaths he reasoned with them from the Scriptures, explaining and demonstrating that the Christ had to suffer and rise again from the dead, saying, this Jesus whom I preach to you is the Christ. That's Acts 17, 2 to 3. Notice the phrase, he reasoned with them from the Scriptures, that Jesus had to die, be buried, and rise again. So, he is quoting the Scriptures, the Old Testament. You say, Pastor, why are you pointing that out? Why aren't we reading the New Testament? Yes. But as we read the New Testament, if you look at verse number 11, you find out that Paul can't help himself. He has to, you know, cite the Old Testament in order to talk about his teaching. He says, for the Scripture says in verse 11, whoever believes on him will not be put to shame. He makes his point that the essential faith is about the lordship of Jesus and about his resurrection from the dead. And then he cites the Old Testament. The passage that he is citing is Isaiah chapter 28, verse 16. And he says, Behold, I lay in Zion a stone for a foundation, a tried stone, a precious cornerstone, a sure foundation. And whoever believes in him will not act hastily. The New American Standard says it this way, He who believes in him will not be disturbed. The New Living Translation said, He who believes in him will never be shaken. And the NIV says, He who trusts in him will never be dismayed. Paul can't get away from this quoting the Old Testament and even that passage. In fact, back in chapter 9 and verse 33, he put it this way, He who believes in him will not be disappointed. The NASB. Peter quoted the same thing several times in his books, but I'll just quote one of them, 1 Peter 2.6. It says, it is contained in the scriptures, there it is again, behold I lay in Zion a chief cornerstone, elect and precious, and he who believes on him will by no means be put to shame. So here's the idea. When a person receives the knowledge of the birth, death, and resurrection of Jesus, and then with his heart he trusts that God did it for him or her, and then he calls out to God in faith, that person, him or her, will be saved. And then there is this. They will never be disappointed, dismayed, shaken, ashamed, or need to act in a hurry out of fear. Because people that hear, believe, and in faith call out to Jesus for salvation will have unshakable peace. In fact, it was said, Jesus himself said it in John 14, 27, Peace I leave with you, my peace I give to you, not as the world gives do I give to you. Let not your heart be troubled, neither let it be afraid. And when the angels came and they stood out there outside of Bethlehem there and appeared to those shepherds, they spoke to the shepherds and they said clearly, they said, peace on earth and what? Goodwill toward men. And so when Jesus arrived, it was peace arriving. And so, listen, I just want to say this this morning. I'm so thankful that at Christmas, this Christmas, that God's gift to me cannot be blown away by a derecho, sickened and killed by a pandemic, threatened by terrorism, or outlawed by the government. Amen? My faith in Jesus and the peace that he has given me is absolutely out of the reach of any eventuality, any trouble, or anything that the government, I am saved and I am full of peace because Jesus has given it to me. Amen? Amen. We are saved and safe in Jesus. Now let's answer a question today. You say, what's it about? You mean that's not part of your preaching? No, that was just saying hello. Let me, let me get to the <laughs> preaching part now. Now, just how great is God's gift to us? Who came? The Lord God came. What did he do? Well, he was proved himself to be the Lord, and then he died, was buried, and rose again. Now then, how great is this gift that he has given to us? Look at verse 12, my focus. For there is no distinction between the Jew and the Greek, for the same Lord over all is rich to all 
who call upon him. Now there's a word on all of our lips right now. Many of you have been thinking about it since, you know, like the first of November, and it's the word gifts. How many of you had to think about gifts a little bit in the last few weeks? Just raise your hand up. How many of you are planning on giving gifts to a few people? Raise your hand up. How many of you are planning on receiving a few gifts? Raise your hand. Not near as many hands. You must be bad people. You've been on the naughty list or something. So giving gifts and receiving gifts. And so that's what we're talking about. How great is God's gift? Well, there's been some pretty amazing gifts given through history. (laughs) A universal symbol of freedom and democracy was a gift of friendship given to the United States in 1884 from France. It was the Statue of Liberty. You knew that was a gift, right? Here's one. In 1907, Tsar Nicholas II gave his wife Alexandra a Fabergé egg called the Rose Trellis Egg, and it was given to commemorate the birth of his son, Alexei, who was born three years earlier. The thing was made of gold, it was pink and green enamel, and it was encrusted from one end to the other with diamonds, and it was priceless, quite a gift. And then there was Mughal Emperor Shah Jahan, who dearly loved his wife, Mumtaz Mahal. You say, Pastor, who in the world is that? Well, he was heartbroken after she died in 1631 while giving birth to their 14th child. He commissioned 20,000 workers to build the Taj Mahal to remember his wife because she died giving birth to the 14th. Now listen, that probably wasn't enough for all that she'd been through in her life. But in any event, he gave her the Taj Mahal. You say, was it expensive? Well, it's almost solid marble. Then there's this. One of the Romanov crown jewels is called the Orloff diamond. It's a rose-cut diamond. Now, ladies, I want you to just think about this for a moment. You know, many of you got a little ring on your finger, and it's got, you know, what, half carat, quarter carat, three quarters of a carat. And then when you could go on from there, some of you folks, you set yourself apart with a whole carat. Well, that's wonderful. The Orloff diamond, <laughs> get this now, uh, was given by Count Grigory Orloff, and he gave it to his 18th century Russian empress girlfriend, Catherine the Great. The only thing was he gave her this diamond that I'm going to describe here in just a moment to win her heart back after another stole it from him. You say, well, how big was this diamond? 200 carats. Biggest carat, biggest diamond known to man. 200 carats. He said, well, did it win her heart back? Nope. She just took the diamond, said thanks, and but I don't want you. <laughs> What a deal. Man. And then there's this. Ancient historians describing the hanging or hanging or terrace guards of Babylon tell the story that Nebuchadnezzar had it built for his wife Amethyst. And the reason he had this built for Amethyst because the land that she was from was of lush green mountains and she hated living in the middle of the desert. And he said, no problem, I'll build you a paradise right here. So he built the hanging gardens of Babylon. Now, for you men that are thinking about what you might want to get your wife for Christmas or your girlfriend for Christmas, you know, just think in terms of Nebuchadnezzar, right, ladies? (laughs) Just give her whatever she wants. No, I'm just kidding. She said, I I, I hate this place. It's so, and so he built in the desert the hanging gardens of Babylon. He said, wow, that's pretty impressive. Yeah, but that's just mere chicken feed compared to what God's unspeakable gift for us is. Now, I'm going to go through this this morning, and I pray you will be blessed. There is no distinction between Jew and Greek, for the same Lord over all is rich to all who call upon him. In the first three chapters of Romans, Paul established that Jews and Gentiles were equally guilty before God. The Jews had religion, and the Gentiles were godless pagans, but they were equally lost. You see, none of us are working our way into God's good favor by our performance, neither by religious performance or irreligious sin. None of those things are the factor. It's just that we were born in sin and sin we do. In chapters 3 through 10, the latter part of chapter 3, he showed how Jews and Gentiles, rich and poor, young and old, men and women, regardless of race, culture, ethnicity, language, or sinful practices, can all be saved by faith in Jesus. Now, folks, we make distinctions, but God makes no distinctions in any of those areas. God declares all equally lost in sin, and he offers the gospel for salvation to all equally. You say, well, Pastor Phil, how great is this gift? 
I want you to look at this phrase there once again. It says, the same Lord over all is rich to all who call upon him. Notice that he is Lord over all. There's no other name, Acts 4, 12. There is no other God, Isaiah 45, 22. I'm God and there is no other. Look unto me and be ye saved, all ye ends of the earth. For I am God and there is no other. There is no other Savior. The critics of the gospel love to say that this Jesus thing and believing that he is the way and the truth and the life is just too exclusive because it puts all people non-Christian outside of any hope. And the answer to that is yes, but at the same time, it offers salvation to everyone who will through him. They can come through Jesus for whoever will call on the name of the Lord Jesus will be saved. Imagine for a moment that you've heard the tale, the tale of a field of diamonds. And this field is just completely loaded with diamonds. They're there for the picking. You just walk across this field and get your sack and just pick up diamonds. And oh yeah, they're the real thing and they're highly valuable. And all you have to do is go and pick them up. But there's just one catch. In order to get into that field, you have got to come through a single gate so that they can verify your, the, who you are and what you're doing. Just one single gate. And if you'll come in that, you, only one at a time, but everybody can come, but you just come in one at a time. You know, I don't believe there'd be anybody complaining about having to go in that single gate to come in and just walk around picking up diamonds in a field and then going cashing in. I don't think anybody complained about that. But for some reason, when we say that Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life, that just seems to blow people's minds. How could God be so terrible as to only allow people into his presence who come through his son? I'm here to announce to you this morning, too bad, there is one way, the way, the truth, the life is the person of Jesus Christ and what he did on this planet for us in our stead when he was, when he was crucified and died and buried and rose again to take our sins away if we believe in him. There's just one way, and there's a whole lot more in God's field than just diamonds. He is rich to all. It's Christmas Sunday, so let me give you three precious thoughts about how great God's gift to us is. The first one is Jesus Christ is all sufficient. He is all sufficient. In this point, I want to emphasize that he has all authority and power and resources. He has no limit. Let's be clear what it is that God has given to us. Back in Isaiah 9, 6, we read it already the other day, but for unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, the son, the only son. Uh, God gave us his son. There's a more familiar verse that we know, John 3, 16, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten what? Son. Galatians 4, 4. Galatians 4, 4 says it this way. It says, God sent forth in the fullness of time had come, God sent forth his son, made, of a law, made under the law, made of a woman, and so on. And I won't quote all of that verse. God sent us his only son. He held nothing back. Listen to this verse. This is, my, this is a verse I'm going to come back to toward the end of the service. But listen to Romans 8, 22. He, God, did not spare his own son, but he delivered him up for us all. He gave his son for all of us. Several thoughts about this sufficiency of Christ. He is sufficient. He is the only Savior. There is no salvation in any other name, for there is no other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. You see, he is the only Savior. That was Acts 4.12. Let me put that a different way. Not only is there no other name that is authority, power, or resource, there's no other name. There is no second name. No other name. Another way of saying it, there's no number two. There is no second name. Let's make a list of all the saviors in the world. Okay, great. Pencil and paper. Jesus. There are no other saviors. You see, why would you say that? Well, Muhammad, Buddha, Confucius, and all the rest died and are buried. But Jesus died and he was buried. And what did he do? He rose from the dead and he's alive with victory over death and hell and the grave and sin. And he is alive. You see, he is the only savior. He is the complete savior, the complete savior. Colossians 1 19 for it pleased the father. And boy, that's what we always want to be doing ourselves is pleasing the father for it pleased the father that in him, all fullness should dwell and by him to reconcile all things to himself 
In chapter 2, verse 9 of Colossians, he also says, For in him dwells all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. Won't repeat that sermon or that point, but everything about the Godhead, the Father, the Son, and the Spirit, it is all visibly present in the person of Jesus Christ. Infinity took up residence in humanity, and we saw him and beheld his glory as the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. You see, he is what we can see of God. He's the complete Savior. He's the only Savior. Savior. He's the complete Savior. <laughs> and the, take this one. He is the limitless Savior. He's limitless. It says in the verse, in, it says in Colossians 2, 3, in him are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. There's something you need to know, it's hidden in Jesus. Something you need to understand, comprehend, and be able to work out, it's all hidden in Jesus. And here's what I want to say to you this morning. He is rich. Jesus is is rich. What is it that you need today? What is it that you're in the market for? What is it that you are hurting and pining for and you need? Well, I want you to know whether it's love or forgiveness or patience or understanding or encouragement or friendship, or if it's faithfulness or loyalty or relief, or is it supplies for life? I've got news for you. He is rich. He is rich to all. He's rich NASB says he is abounding in riches. Hebrews chapter 1 verse 2 says in these last days God has spoken to us by his son whom he has appointed heir of all things. You say is that significant? Yeah, he's the heir of the sun, the moon, the stars, the planets, the galaxies. Everything that the Hubble telescope can look at, he is the inheritor of. Everything, whether it's macro or micro, whether you look at it through a microscope or whether you look at it through a telescope, he is the heir of everything. The Bible says in Ephesians chapter 1 verse 10 that he's come to redeem everything and to unify everything in the person of Christ. He is the heir. He is the one that's going to inherit everything. You see, he is rich. He's unbelievably rich, and he shares. He's the limitless Savior. He is rich. He has it all. He owns it all. Let me continue with the second thought. Jesus Christ's riches are available to all. Look at the verse. Once again, it's our key verse. There is no distinction between Jew and Greek. For the same Lord over all is rich to all who call on him, or whoever calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Jews can call. Gentiles can call. Religious people can call. Irreligious people can call. Moral people can call. Immoral people can call. Rich can call. Poor can call. All can call. I want you to understand with me this morning, you know, the young, the old, all can call on the name of the Lord. I heard something this morning, Bonnie brought it to my attention, not this morning, this week, Bonnie brought it to my attention uh, about how often we say things like this. We say, oh, I, I just wouldn't, I don't know, these children, these young people, these children that are being born into this world with the trouble and all that's going on in the world with the politics and with the social unrest, oh, it's just a terrible time to be having children. Listen to me for a minute. That's been happening through eternity for all time. How would you like to have been born in the days when Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego were carried off to Babylon? And what about Jesus? And in Jesus' time, all you had to do was be a boy baby in Bethlehem under two years old when the king said, kill them all. You understand? In other words, times are tough. Times are rough. Times are difficult. But I want to say to every young person in the room, just like Esther, just like Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, you were born to this time. And God is not surprised. God is rich. He's rich to everyone. He's rich to everyone who calls on him. He's rich to the young. He's rich to the old. He's rich to the rich. He's rich to the pauper. He, he's rich. And I want you to get this in your heart this morning. He is rich to all. Listen to this. The Lord has anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives, the recovery of sight to the blind, and set at liberty those that are oppressed. In the first century, the poor, the sick, the blind, the infirm, the impotent were all considered to be out of reach, untouchable, guilty of some sin, too horrible to be forgiven. Even his disciples asked the question, oh, whose sin was it, his parents or him before he was born? He's rich to all. He was rich to the poor, rich to the wealthy. He is rich. Listen to the word of God. You better flip over to Ephesians so you can mark this because this is just incredible. He is rich in mercy. Ephesians 2, 4. 
God who is rich in mercy because of his great. You know, do you ever get in that place? Lord, I know I'm trying your mercy. Would you please forgive me again? Did you ever get to that place? I know I did it again. I said it again. You know, I had this anger problem. I just keep popping my court. I keep saying what I shouldn't. I keep doing, oh, Lord, can you keep forgiving me? You know what? I want to tell you something. If he told his disciples to forgive 70 times 7, he's not going to break that rule himself. You see, he is rich in mercy. Because of the great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in trespasses and sins, he made us alive together with Christ. He does not differentiate. He is rich in mercy. You know what? The same verse says he's rich in love. His love is greater than we can understand. I better read chapter 3, verse number 18. Chapter 3, verse number 18 says this. Says we, says we want to be able to comprehend with all the saints what is the width and length and depth and height and to know the love of Christ which passes knowledge that you may be filled with all the fullness of God. You see, he's rich in mercy, he's rich in love, and his love passes knowledge. It's knowing the unknowable. It, it, if we know him, then we know the unknowable depths of his love. And Paul was praying that they would get a grip on just how great, wide, deep, tall, long, how full his love is You see, Jesus' love has no limit. It's so much love, it can't be described. Um, we seldom in our life love to the limit of our capacity to love, but Jesus loves us and his love has no limit. He's rich and then he's exceedingly rich in grace. Ephesians 2, 7, it says here, it says that in the ages to come, he might show us the exceeding riches of his grace and his kindness toward us in Christ Jesus Sometimes people say, well, you know, what are we going to do when we're in heaven? Are we just going to sit around and play harps all the time? You know what? It's going to take an eternity for God to keep opening the doors and keep rolling back the truth of just how rich his grace is to us. It's just going to keep like an onion, peeling it back. And more and more, the longer we're there, the more great his grace is going to be a scene from us. He is rich. You think that's why he also said in another place, I has not seen nor ear heard nor his heart understood those things that are prepared for those that love him. You see, it's way beyond our understanding. It is knowledge of the unknowable. It's knowing his love. He's rich. And then his riches are endless. Chapter 3 and verse 8 of Ephesians. Paul talking about himself to me. Who am less than the least of all the saints. This grace was given that I should preach among the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of Christ there it is. It's unsearchable. It's unfathomable. It's endless. Now let's just stop and think about this just for a minute. There's some pretty rich dudes alive today, pretty rich guys, household names, you know. Bill Gates, he's a computer programming genius. And Jeff Bezos, he's a wholesale organizational wizard. And by the way, he's got so much money that he's, you know, building rockets and taking people out for rides in space and things like that. And then Elon Musk, whoever names their name, how do you come up with that, Elon Musk? Anyway. Out of the box, uh, he's an out of the box thinker and inventor. And then there's Warren Buffett. He's a plotting, calculating investor. Uh, all of these men have amassed wealth that would make King Solomon blush. But I just want to tell you something. There is still a limit to their wealth. But not Jesus. There's no limit. His wealth is without limit. And not only that, these men are not generous without measure. But Jesus is. You say, well, how do you know that? Well, because we can line up at Je you can line up at any one of those men's house and stand there till you're blue in the face, but I doubt that they're going to come out and just start writing checks for people lined up outside their house. But you know, we can do that with God all the time. You say, what do you mean? I say, well, it's called prayer. Because you see, we're his children. We belong to him. We're part of his family. And if I'm not mistaken, the Bible teaches in Romans chapter 8 and verse 16 that Jesus is the heir of God. He's receiving everything. And we are heirs of God, joint heirs with Jesus Christ. And so, in a sense, we're rich. You say, well, how come I can't lay my hands on it? Well, because God doesn't want it to be in a place where rust and moth and corruption and theft happens. He wants it to be in a place, 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 3 to 5, in a place where moth or rust or nothing can enter and where it's reserved, kept by the power of God for you into eternity and so that you can have it forever and never lose it. You see, you are rich. We are rich because Jesus is rich. I hope you understand this this morning. He is rich to all who call upon him. We could keep going, the riches of his grace. He's rich. His riches are endless. He is rich. He is rich as an inheritance. 
and he is rich to all. I love this. Isaiah 55, 1, everyone who thirsts, come to the waters, and you who have no money, come, buy, eat. Yes, come without, come, buy wine and milk without money and without price. He is rich. The third thing, and finally, Jesus Christ is all we need. He's all we need. So what have I said so far? I'm just giving you three truths about this unspeakable gift. Jesus Christ is all sufficient. It's all in him. Second, Jesus Christ's riches are available to all. There's nobody off his wish list. And so he's rich and he's sufficient and his riches are available to all. And now Jesus' riches are all we need. If we were to look through the scriptures and see how God or how the New Testament authors write concerning the grace of God, the love of God, the mercy of God. They use superlatives. They speak in profusions. They don't, they don't cut, they don't cut any corners with the words they use. God's gift to us is this. It is free. Ephesians 2, 8, 9, for by grace you have been saved through faith and that not of yourselves. It is the what? Gift by definition. It is a free gift of God. And then here's another one. God's gift provides Everything. Oh, what a verse. 1 Corinthians chapter 1 and verse 30. Of him, of him, speaking of the Father, you are in Christ Jesus who became for us four things. He became for us wisdom from God. How many of you never need help with making a choice, making a decision, getting it right? How many of you need wisdom from time to time? All right. He is the wisdom for us from God. And he is righteousness. You say, what is that? It's that satisfying life that God will receive because there's no blame in it. There's no sin in it. There's no wrong in it. Can you, do you have that kind of righteousness on your own? Can we say I've never done anything wrong? Can we say I'm even since the day I trusted Jesus, I've lived perfectly? No, we can't do that because God has made him to be righteousness for us. That's the whole substitutionary death. And then sanctification sanctification it's a process which whereby God through the Holy Spirit is making us more and more like Jesus Christ but it is purchased for us and the process begun in the person of Jesus Christ and he is sanctification for us we've been set apart from him it is redemption that is the price that had to be paid are you getting this it's a free gift because God is because Jesus is rich God provides everything in the person of Christ because he is rich and then God's gift is something else it's abundant Abundant, John 4.14, 4, whoever drinks, speaking to the Samaritan woman at the well, whoever drinks of the water that I will give him will never thirst, but the water that I shall give him will become in him a fountain of water springing up into everlasting life. In other words, what God gives to us is not just enough, it's more than enough, it's abundant. And why is that? Because Jesus is rich, he is rich. Psalm 37, 5 and following says for us not to get all upset when we look around and see the unrighteous people of the world become prosperous and wealthy. Why? Because like the flower of the grass and like the weeds of the field, they're going to dry up and fade away and tomorrow we won't know where they are. But we will abide forever and ever with him in his presence. Why? Because he is rich. And in him we're rich. It's Christmas and you're worried about gifts. You've already, if you've received the gift of eternal life in the person of Jesus Christ, you have received he who is rich, abundantly, incredibly rich. God's gift satisfies forever. John 6, 35, I am the bread of life. He who comes to me will never hunger and he who believes in me shall never, never, never thirst. Why is that? Because he is rich and God makes us complete. I want to tell you something. You're never going to be satisfied, filled up, content, and complete on this earth. I don't care what project you accomplish. I don't care how big your bank account gets. I, listen, if I were to go around the room and say, hey, what, what is it that it would take just to make life complete? We'd all have a list, maybe one thing, five things or 50 things to make us complete. But I want you to know the Bible says in Colossians 2.10, we are complete in him. Oh, I shall be satisfied when I rise in the future and I awake in thy likeness. I'm going to be like him, the psalmist says. Then I'm going to be satisfied. I'm going to be complete. I'm going to, it's all going to make sense then. You know why? Because he is rich. 
In him we are complete of his fullness. We have all received grace for grace. And in receiving Jesus' fullness, we receive all we need because he is very, very rich and you are complete in him. Jesus is rich, folks. Jesus is rich to all. He is sharing his riches with all who believe in their heart. And they call out to him with, with their mouth. And I want to say in and of yourselves, you are not rich. And I want to say that Bill Gates, Jeff Bezos, Elon Musk, and all the rest in and of themselves are not rich. They're rich temporarily, but they are not rich eternally. Naked came I into this world, and how are we going to leave, according to Job? Naked. Not taking no, no U-Haul trailers going with anybody. Not happening. You are not rich until you are rich in him. I started with this verse, and let me read it to you. Romans 8, 32, let me finish the verse. I said, God did not spare his own son, but delivered him up for us all. And then it says, and how shall he not with him also freely give us all things? Is that he started with the maximum. He started with the gift of his son. He, this is the maximum gift. It's all in him. He's rich. He's wealthy. He's, he's, he's all in all. And he gave us his son. How shall he not also give us all things that are necessary, all things we need? You see, he, Jesus is rich. God the Father has given us the son, and his son is the heir of all things. And he is, he is incredibly, unspeakably rich, and he is sharing with those who believe. Have you believed in him? Because we are rich, he is rich. I just have to ask, don't you want Jesus? He wants you. He died for you. There's an old song we used to sing. I want you to put the words, go ahead and put the words up there. How many of you remember this little chorus, Christ is all I need? Stand with me. See if you can remember this chorus and sing it with me. I'm going to start on the wrong note, so somebody better start on the right note and get us going on this. <clears throat> I used to sing, but it's been so long I can't even sing anymore, but I, I think you'll be able to get it if we get going. Sing it with me. Christ, oh, come on. Christ is all I need, oh, all I need. The words are up there, sing it. nothing going to make your Christmas better than to call on Jesus to be your Savior if you've never done so. How many of you can give testimony, Pastor Phil? I've already called on Jesus. and Maybe I don't get all the magnitude of it, but I know he has made me rich, and I'm so glad I've called on Jesus. Say amen. Amen. Now let that be a witness to the rest of you here this morning. You never called on Jesus. Listen, you don't get to be the child of God by assimilation, affiliation, or association. No, no, no. You don't get to be the child of God by coming in this room and sitting down and just associating with people who are the children of God. You get to be the child of God and get to be part of the inheritance when you say, I believe you died. You are the Lord. You are God. You came and died for me, and you were buried, and you rose again, and it's because I'm a sinner, and I believe it. I'm calling on you. Save me, Jesus. That is how you get to be part of the inheritance. You bow your heads and close your eyes. Christ is all I need. 
because he's rich and because he gives it away because he wants you to be part of his family if you'll call on Jesus he'll save you do something like this heads are bowed eyes are closed and if you're not sure about your salvation direct your heart to God and say something like this say God that man's talking up there but it seems like he's talking to me and about me and I recognize that I'm not rich. In fact, I'm full of sin and I'm separate from you. But I believe this message, I believe that you, the Lord Jesus, came and that you were crucified and that you rose again from the dead. I believe this. And, and I know that you have said that you are rich to all who call. And Lord, today I'm calling. I'm confessing with my mouth that I'm a sinner, that you are Lord. And in my heart, I'm asking you, save me, Jesus. Save me from my sin. Thank you for dying for me. In Jesus' name, amen. Heads are bowed, eyes are closed. I'm going to let you go in just one second. Who would say... Pastor, I followed you in that prayer. I asked Jesus to save me today because he's able to, and I believe it. Would you just raise your hand so I can pray for you? Am I going to make you make a speech or do anything? Is there one? Just put your hand up. I'll pray for you. God bless you, my friend. Amen. Who else? Put your hand up. I, I just asked Jesus to save me. Amen. God bless you. Dear Father, thank you for working in hearts, for drawing people to yourself. Thank you that you are the inheritor of all things, that you pay the enormous price, and that you share this grace with everyone. In Jesus' name.